on part one and two of this series, it was all about developing your understanding so that when you get boots on the ground, you now see the woods in a whole different way so that you understand the best places to locate elk. Now y'all, here we go, straight out of the Elk Bros playbook. Tonight, it's all about how we find elk from day one. On today's show, it's part three of our series, and y'all, it's time to hunt them up. No more waiting. These are the Elk Bros keys to the game. That discussion, our Elk Bros shout outs, and we introduce the newest member of our coaching staff. So my friends, pull up a chair, adjust your volumes just right, and welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting, brought to you by ElkBros.com, with your host, Gilbert Ornelas, and elk hunting coach, Joe Gillian. You want to hunt elk? They live to hunt elk. Their goal is to share with you what they have learned grinding it out for over 35 seasons, doing what they love. So come on into camp and set a spell. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunters. Hello there, everyone. If it's your first time with us, glad to have you and hope you enjoy our show. And as always, for those blue collar hunters following our show and grinding it out with us every week, welcome back to Elk Camp. I'm Gilbert Ornelas, the host of your show, coming to you from Spring, Texas, and from the DFW area. That's right, the northern don of the Venezuelan mafia, Manano Gratarón, and from the Intercontinental Airport himself. That's right. One of the members of the Venezuelan Mafia, Luis Gonzalez, the Southern hey. Don of the uh, Venezuelan dude. Mafia. Okay, so uh, Luis you, Gonzalez. you all need to listen to the introduction of the previous podcast. That's when you got it right. <laughs> and yes, sir, and it, in Cimarron, New Mexico, our elk hunting coaches are in the house. Leroy, the Ninja Chavez, and WWJGD, what would Joe Gillia do? And introductions are order, in order, Joe. Yep, that's exactly right. He sent me an email today and said that he is the king of the Venezuela Mafia. <laughs> <laughs> well, much better than being the queen. Ramarena. Oh, <laughs> so, Houston, Houston, we got a problem. Houston, we got a problem. Oh, uh, yes, yeah, sir. man, because you that's hear this be accent. You know what, though, Manano, his accent sounds a lot like yours, man. Just listen up. And everybody, I know that uh, this will be a first time for everybody to meet him. Uh, he is from an undisclosed section of Tejas down there. <laughs> for sure. He's the Elk Bro Crew. He is the newest addition to our coaching staff. We want to give a warm welcome. <laughs> and and we'll find other ways to welcome you, too. Mr. Cole Wilkes. How you doing, Cole? Cole Wilkes in the What's house. What's up, y'all? Another, <laughs> long, another Lone Star State brother. Yes, sir. That's so awesome. Cole, Congratulations. Cole. Welcome to Elk so, with us. Welcome, but you're not the king, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I told I told Joe, I was like, we got to stir them up a little bit. We got to get them going right off the bat. Oh, that's easy to do, son. <laughs> yes, sir. I knew it was. Yeah. Yeah, good try, though. That was a good try. <laughs> <laughs> so I want, I want everybody to, I mean, we have a lot of listeners that aren't seeing this. And one thing that uh, that you're not seeing is the fact that we're su real surprised that we have Luis with us tonight, man. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, number one, because, of, you know, the mafia hasn't been able to show up together here for a little while. So right. number two, <laughs> because, because Luis is waiting on his mother to arrive um, via Mexico, right? Isn't she coming in from flying out? Yeah, she flew Venezuela, Cancun, Cancun, Houston, but then uh, the flight already got here. She just got pulled into that little immigration room uh, with further questions, so I don't know how long they're going to hold them up. Her and my sister are, are being held there, and I don't know uh, how long it's going to take. So, so the yes, sir, I'm waiting out here. He's the in airport. the airport, man. That's awesome. That's, that's a committed brother right there. Oh man. Right, man! So we've had Gilbert from outside a convenience store, and that where in the heck was that, man? When you so were... Wally, Louisiana, <laughs> yeah, <man. laughs> and uh, just a little elbow spot there in Louisiana. Yeah, yeah. and Cole, oh, tell everybody where you're from, man. I'm from uh, Burnett, Texas, uh, just north of Austin, about an hour north of Austin. God's country. Yes, sir. 
Yeah. That right is that hill is country. beautiful hill country, man. So we I spent about I spent about two weeks up there and burn it all around the lake and everything, uh doing insurance claims a couple weeks. But well, right there in that freeze that y'all yeah. saw the pictures I showed you of the hogs on the snow. <laughs> Fredericksburg is between Austin and, and San Antonio, right? It's just Fredericksburg, a little west, west of there. Just west, west right? A little west of Austin. It's a beautiful, beautiful country. Beautiful town. Yeah, mm-hmm. man. So, and Cole, um, you better Welcome, jump brother. in tonight, man, because... Oh, um, I'm here. <laughs> he's, he, you know, he, he uh, texted me. He was so anxious to get on tonight, man. He was at, at the house, and he said, I'm just sitting here doing cow calls and elk bugles and <laughs> so That's that was awesome. really awesome so cole will be um on our coaching staff and he's excited because cole will be showing up at hunt wars um coming up in september he'll be with the uh, bros and elk camp this year it's gonna it's gonna be epic man it's just gonna be really really cool so did you, did you have a job bro <laughs> <laughs> yeah. job bros my job stops at the end of August, and then it uh, starts back up again around January. I want your job, man. Dude, oh, no doubt. What we got to do to do that? that? Oh, oh, man. Yeah. So look. <laughs> yes. I work I, I work for myself, guys, Perfect, and brother. I pretty much set my life up to hunt from, you know, as many times as I possibly can. Uh, well, you, you need know, to start so, setting your life up to yeah. maintaining the elk bros during hunt season, too. Yeah. So well, just keep yeah. us in mind. Let's talk about this a bit more, yeah, okay? Man. Let's make this so, a problem. So what do you do, yeah. what do, you do from uh, <laughs> January to August? Uh, so I, I, man, you name it, Big O, it, it's anything. <laughs> Metal buildings, fencing, landscape, driveways. Gotcha, yeah, a little bit of I don't turn down any of my customers. Uh, yeah, sure. It's it's all word of mouth, so I I can take every job I can get. Sweet, dude. So, he, okay, he's another cool. key. Man after my own heart. And, and you know, to honor <laughs> to honor Cole coming on the, the show, I mean, you notice he, you know, he's bought all the Elk Bros gear there. He's wearing the yeah. shirt. He's got the hat going on. And to honor that um, tonight, I'm wearing the Flatlander hat. That is, so cool. this is this is Cole's uh, Flatlander uh, emblem right here. Oh, and, man, cool. And to all of our listeners, if you want to learn something about Cole Wilkes, and and he's an incredible, uh, not only is he a gifted hunter, he's just a, he's got a teaching mentality. He does incredible YouTube videos. Go on YouTube, check out the Flatlander, check out Cole Wilkes, and you get to meet the man behind the Flatland emblem right there. Okay. Um, also, teaching mentality. Where is it? Yeah. So. Um, tonight's topic, y'all, is a three. It's part of our three-part series, finding elk from day one of the hunt. And tonight is how we find them and hunt them up. But for next week's episode, we're going to finish up this series, guys, in the way that you guys love it. We're going to do it with some info, a plethora. I, I got that word from Gilbert. We're going to have us a plethora of questions from the Elk Bros mailbox. And get this. Get ready, listeners. Live questions from you, our listeners. That's right. Tomorrow night, that's Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Pacific Time, 7.30 p.m. Mountain Time, 8.30 p.m. Central Time, and 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Our show will be recorded live on the Elk Bros YouTube channel. That's tomorrow night, Wednesday. So if you haven't subscribed, go to our YouTube channel and subscribe, and be sure to turn on your notifications. That way, when we go live, you'll be jumping on with us and, you know, the guys love doing this. They love doing the live questions and everything. So we're, we're really looking forward to doing that with y'all tomorrow night. Okay? So don't miss it. And with that plethora of <laughs> questions, a kerfuffle might break out. A kerfuffle? <laughs> <laughs> yes. If y'all need to look that up, that means a fight. And if it's Manano and Luis being around, it's going to have a kerfuffle involved. I promise. Plethora. Yeah. <laughs> a plethora of questions would start a kerfuffle between Manano and Luis. Where did you, where did you find that word? <laughs> <laughs> She's, I got a kid I, I going said, to MIT, before, brother. I, I, she I hits before, me with man, it. He gets up every morning and he Googles all the weird sayings and Jesus. the weird, weird words, and he uses them across the day. But every day yeah. is a different he, one. He's so a I, you never know when you're around Big O. 
<laughs> Guys, y'all know what time it is. It's time for the Elk Bro shout outs. If you're new to our show, this is a shout out to a few cities with the most listeners topping our charts this week, Joe. Yeah, and because he's roaming around through the airport right now, I'm going to take this for Luis. The top listening city this week is the Garden State's largest metropolis, the hey, first bro, to I'm stop. Have to go. Hey, bro. Thanks for Peace, showing up. We'll see Thanks, you later. All right. Hey, hey, Ma. How are you? Look at there. <laughs> Hello. Later, brother. All right, man. Cole, good to meet you, man. Keep Manano in check. Remind see you him. See you in hell. Remind him. Yes, sir. He's not the leader. Okay. Later. Absolutely, Peace man. Peace out. <laughs> uh, all right joe you want me to, you want to start at the top or what no no we'll get going man we okay, just got cool. to say goodbye to luis man everybody get to see Gosh. i mean hey this no, i'm relaxed yeah, this, this is as real as it gets right here man no luis, doubt elk camp getting to meet his his mom right there in the airport so that's way cool man so like i said this is the garden city's largest metropolis the first to sign the bill of rights and the cultural center of this state the nation's third oldest city and the birthplace of frank sinatra old blue eyes and the boss bruce springsteen today this port city where service oh and there's only two of these in the nation i'm going to see if you guys know where the other one is but this port city is where self-service gas stations are prohibited. You're not allowed to pump your own gas in this in this state. Um, is is the primary container shipping terminal for the East Coast of the United States and has several nicknames, including Brick City, the Gateway City, and the City by the River. Our top listening city is Newark, New Jersey. Yeah, yeah. Jersey's in the house. What about it? it. <laughs> How you doing? How you Pump doing? Gas. What about it, man? <laughs> How you doing? So let, awesome let me ask. Music. Where what in what other state are you not allowed to pump your own gas? You guys remember? Yeah. Oh, nice. Anybody? Oregon. California. Oregon. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Really? There you go. Oregon. Yep. You, you cannot pump your own gas there. What, what's the reason behind that? <laughs> what's um, oh, crazy. what's like the security? reason behind it? Uh, man, I guess um, they probably had a pumpers union or something. I don't know, bro. I mean, it's like, I mean, maybe they it, just want to employ more people that can. It it pump does ensure employment. Yeah. Absolutely. This top city is really part of the larger city of Cincinnati and is named after the earliest human in the area. The, na the natives are believed to have been pre-Columbian era people of the Adena culture, a prehistoric er earth. It's earthen, bro. Built by the Adena is located in the center of the city, and it is listed on, on the National Register of Historic Places. This is going to Norwood, Ohio. Can, Norwood, Ohio in the house. Uh, an earthen mound an earthen is on the earthen. National Register. I've Art never, that, that's a first for me. That is way cool. Yes, Norwood, Ohio. Earthen mound. Ohio, I'm going to Google that too. <laughs> hey, you guys in Ohio, man, love having you. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening. Absolutely. Up next, uh, this city is located for, oh, this city is the location for the award-winning television series Northern Exposure. For years, viewers knew this city as Sicily, Alaska. Huh. The city is located in the Cascade Mountains, 80 miles east of Seattle. It's also the filming location of the runner stumbles and the man in high castle in its early heyday. The town prospered as a coal mining center in Roslyn, Washington, Roslyn, Washington, the and Washington the crew, the Washington crew keeps showing out, Joe. I'm, I'm you know, I'm going to be interested to see which state has the most cities listed for us. I mean, you know, Texas is like its own daggum country. I mean, you could just throw out any name. It's probably a city in Texas. But I'm, I, but let me tell you what, Washington has been showing up, man. Uh, every week. Every week. Every, every, every week, week, man. That's right. It's awesome. Joe, this <laughs> next city is known as the Resaca City. The Resaca City is a dry riverbed and is 410 feet wide and flows through the middle of the city. It is now the main canal of a large irrigation system, a small border town, 
at the bottom tip of Texas. This city is about 20 miles from the Gulf of Mexico, and I've been there, Joe. It, is, <laughs> it was first named Diaz after the Mexican president, Porfirio Diaz, but it's changed to honor the beloved pioneer, Benjamin Hicks, in San Benito, Texas. San Benito. San Benito, just south of Harlingen, just north of Matamoros there is San a Benito. Okay, San so Benito. you've just said, I, so that's three cities in Texas I don't know. So what else is it close Look, to? You talk, so you know at the very bottom where the boot is? Uh -huh. Matamoros is at the very bottom there. That is the last city before you cross into Mexico. Okay. So and when you come up from the boot, you'll get to San Benito and then Harlingen. And if you just cut over to the west a little bit, you'll be in McAllen. But that that's the area of the state we call the Valley. Oh, all right. So for our Texas aficionados, who was Benjamin Hicks? Uh, he was a pioneer, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> you had to ask. You had to ask. <laughs> I passed geometry, bro. I did yeah, not man. pass Texas history, but I did pass geometry. <laughs> hey, man, you just said he's a pioneer. You know? <laughs> hey, so this is going to be a first right here. Cole, you're on deck, man. Hopefully I can read and, and, and I, hey, look, before he gets started, I want my brothers to listen close to this because we're we're introducing him to the Elk Bros way of life right here. All right. All right, Cole. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. This top listening city, even if you walk in a circle, is part of the research triangle region that includes 17 universities and colleges, including Duke University. Uh, driving on a circular tour around the city, you will find that it is also known as Bull City and the City of Medicine. Uh, this community expanded rapidly after the Civil War due to its tobacco industry. And when touring, you can then circle back to Bennett Place, which commemorates the location where uh, Rebel Joseph E. Johnston surrendered to Union General William T. Sherman in the Civil War. Durham, North Carolina. Durham. Durham, North Carolina. Carolina. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Nice job for Durham showing so, up. From the a... West Coast to the very East Coast, Joe. Well, I, and oh, I don't brother. know if you noticed, but um, we haven't been able to do it in the woods yet with Cole. Right. But I just got him to walk in a circle three times. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I noticed like immediately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, Joe. I'm going to tell oh, you, Cole, my load Cole. is heavy. <laughs> what was Cole. it? Oh, my Man, God. dude. Look, this guy, this guy is toting us up this mountain. And I'm not lying. He just thinks that he gets the biggest kick out of just – you know going as hard as he can go and watching me damn near pass out and uh you know i was like dude i got to have a second you know <laughs> and uh he's like i think i'm just gonna walk big o in circles i said that is a bunch of bull you are not walking me in circles let me tell you something joe i passed geometry okay <laughs> i barely passed but i passed it so i'm know what a circle looks like uh, you're they not cheated. gonna make me go in a circle you're killing me joe i, I can tell y'all one a minute i can tell you one thing I'm going to be honest right here for you guys that when y'all hear that bugle late in the evening, I'm that other guy like Joe. You better not let me hear that sucker either, or I'm taking off after oh, well, I can tell you what, partner. <laughs> if you can hear it, you can go to it. I promise. That's right. Yeah, I'll be with bad turn come. Yeah, we're going to. I know how far I can go, Cole, and it ain't that far. Gilbert, yeah. did you just say if you can hear it, you can goat it. I, I, did, I said you, you, you can hear it. Goats? I said if you can hear it, you can go to oh, it. Oh, oh, I I thought I heard goat, man, because we had a lot of people, man, that said that they. <laughs> I got emails about how people just said, "Hey, we got a couple of goats. If Gilbert wants to show up." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I ain't I ain't messing with no goats, Joe. Like I told you, you mess with one goat, you can. Paint the Sistine Chapel. They ain't going to call you Michelangelo, but you mess with oh, one man. goat. You'll be that goat man forever. Oh, my 6.30 p.m. If you can hear it, you can ignore it. 
All right. <laughs> so we're in part three, man. We're in part three. And our topic of tonight's show, finding elk from day one of the hunt. And this is hunting them up, guys. We have, uh, hopefully in the first one, I really worked hard at trying to let everybody know out there that I think sometimes we overcomplicate this whole thing about trying to find elk. That there's a lot of things that we do, like Gilbert you know just showed you as a as a fisherman how much that actually relates that it's not about seeing the whole lake it's about seeing where the fish are where they like to be in that lake and that there's certain things that show that right so we did that and then last week it was about locating man it was about locating elk um and when we talk about locating elk, we're talking about finding the area where it, where we know that elk are moving around in those areas. That's showing the sign and what to look for and how to see that, how to see things. And I, and I got an email from one of our listeners that's just like, man, he said, you know, it was so cool because the way that we described the meadow to him and he said you know before i go into a meadow and he said i might oversimplify it right now but basically when i went in i saw a meadow and then as it was described through y'all's eyes he said that i was seeing things totally different man because it's it is it's all about if you know what to look for in the clues out there so hopefully now you know what to look for to locate the areas that you're going to want to be able to find elk in and you can determine real quick not only where elk are but where they are not and if you're finding those areas man you scratch that off and just remember the types of things that we're looking for we're looking for those bedding areas we're looking for that really really good grass and feed or other attractions that's going to get them there and uh chav you have uh, an article on our site that talks about some of the other types of foods that the elk like and uh, what were those again bud okay if i recall of course acorn acorn top of the list uh in our in our particular area even the pino nut right you know and they're not in season every year. Mm -hmm. It's like once every five years, but I've actually seen elk uh, get the antlers in the trees and kind of shake them mm -hmm. and, then, and then eat whatever falls down, the pods or the individual pinion nut. Uh, they also, if it's a rainy season, they like mushrooms. Um, they really like mushrooms. Oh, by the way, too, Chav, um, one of our one of our listeners that went and read your article and saw the pictures and I put the pictures in there. I just found a picture of a mushroom. He oh, said, "Well, <laughs> yeah." He's like, <laughs> <laughs> he said, "I hope the elk aren't eating that, and don't you guys eat that one too because it's poisonous." So if yeah. you see that photo, <laughs> make sure you yeah, know. It's those yeah. big white fluffy ones that are are yeah. good. Um, but I'm well, you know, going through well, eating the mushrooms. Of course, the the uh, aspen bark. You know they like aspen bark. Uh, a lot of times, if uh, down, if you see a downed aspen, a lot of times it's all eaten up. Yeah. You know they, they like that, and uh, I don't recall the fifth one. <laughs> yeah, because you had the anise, and a lot of it is like flower oh, yeah. plants and stuff like that. And yeah, remember, yeah. they're going to go to those forbs and those thrushes and stuff like that early on. The greens, the you know the the really good grass and stuff, and they're going to save all that woody, brushy stuff for later on. You know when there's yeah. less to eat, they they don't eat themselves out of house and home. So you yeah, know, going back to uh, the anise, you know it's a spice, but uh, if you walk into an area and you smell licorice. Mm -hmm. Elk really like that area. So yeah. you know, be aware be aware of that. Yeah. So so we were talking about those places to locate and, and those things that to, that are going to attract them to that. Now y'all we're going to get down to the brass tacks, okay? And you know, once you locate where you have elk sign and and we say from day 1. And and I'll tell you, on day 1 when we go out we are actually, our group, if we haven't done any locating ahead of time, if you haven't gotten there two days early. Cole, how do you guys get there early or you start hunting from day one? Um, I always try to get there early. Uh, a lot of times Kyle can't always get there with me. But, yeah, I try to get there early just to uh, 
you know, try to cut that curve right yep. off the bat. Hey, sense. so that that's your location phase, right? <clears throat> and yeah. hopefully, I mean, not only are you locating, looking for the sign, you might get some eyes on, you might get some ears on. And mm -hmm. and let me let me make a point to a lot of you guys too, in that I've had people tell me that they showed up and on this is like September one, man, and he, and they say that the elk are they're going berserk, they're screaming, and they're like, wow, man, this is going to be so cool. And then like day two, they're like. We go. I mean, they were just screaming their heads off. We get up on hunting day to go out, and it's it's just yeah. dead silent, right? Yeah. And and they're like, "Well, what happened? Is it the pressure? You know?" I, and I want everybody to remember what makes those bulls start screaming, especially early season. Mm -hmm. That's a cow in heat, man. For sure. And, and so you get a cow that comes in heat; those bulls are going to go nuts. But that cow is only going to be in heat between 15 to 20 hours man mm -hmm. and once that's done they're done because it, it's early there's only there's limited cows that have done that right yeah. so that's just yeah, something. Also, yeah just to uh, butt in huh? <laughs> uh, as far as getting there early too you you kind of want to get acclimated to the altitude yes. especially if you're absolutely flat and it might especially be if you're a flatlander full well, acclimation, you want to do that yes sir yeah <laughs> yeah because cole i i think you were saying you have a little issue uh no it wasn't you that told me do you have any altitude issue or are you good no i don't have any altitude issues yeah i think i think it was tony Winthrop that told me that you know because he comes from basically sea you know level. sea level and then comes up and he, he says he's really got to deal with that a little bit so yeah, those, those couple of days early will help you to locate. Gilbert always comes early to be able to acclimate. He's on his aspirin regiment. If you haven't heard that before, he likes to take and and what's the what do you do with the bear, one bear aspirin? You know, one bear, one, bear, one bear aspirin a day. Nothing serious. But how many days before? A week before the hunt. Yeah, just to get that get that get blood a little bit a little bit of thin thinner blood and man you know if I can get there a couple of days early I won't have that big pounding headache on day one you know because uh, I'm gonna it, and you know the past couple of years been easier and easier for me and I think my body goes oh yeah man about 360 days ago we were up here doing this shit you know so uh, I think it remembers that but. At the end of the day, I need that two days because it feels like a monkey sitting on my chest, you know? Yeah, absolutely, um, man. And so if, you know, when you guys get there, you get a chance early to acclimate, you get a chance to locate, to find those areas with the sign. Um, and one thing that we talked about in the last one was we were like not going into the calling because if you're hearing bugles, you've located elk. Yeah, now, buddy. Yeah, now now they're you there around here. Yeah, they're there, man. So now yeah. all you got to do is hunt them up, man. You you've got yeah. to go and find them now. I mean, you can hear an elk way off, but you still got to be able to go get on that and find that elk, right? So yeah. what we're doing now is this is our playbook, and we're going to hunt them up. And there are several ways to go about this. Now I want you to understand all of these things I'm about to talk about here are something that we have in our toolbox and we can use any of these from time to time if necessary but we're going to talk about our main strategy and steps here in a second and we're going to cover some of these other ones and 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 these are strategies that we use that are possible to use that you can use to be able to hunt up an elk because guys there are two ways to be able to find elk there's two. One is is to be able to go out and try to have an, an encounter in their time. In other words, you're going through the woods and you're hoping to run into elk. And one of the problems with that is, is like what we talked about in our last one, is that if you, it, it's like shopping in Walmart. But Nano, do you, do you ever shop in Walmart with your wife, man? Yes. But Do you have a hard a time idea. finding her, man? It's not a good idea, Joe. Going <laughs> with, Anna, with Anna to Walmart, it's not a good idea. <laughs> hard to stay up with her, man. So the, the problem is, is we could actually be in an area where elk is, but an elk could be behind us so much or in front of us so much or coming through. We are in, there, in that area at that moment in time, and we think that, Oh, there's no elk in here. I don't get no responses. Now, number one, most people think when they're not hearing an elk that they're not responding. 
Understand that's not the case. Elk can respond in multiple ways. And one way that they can respond is by coming into you silently. All right. So I just want to make sure that that you realize that. So the first way is, is to just go out there and hope to have an encounter by being in the areas that elk are. All right. Um, you want to be able to be in those places uh, where you can in their bedding or on their trails or where their feed areas are right um you want to be in the in the wallows and water sources those are things areas that you can be to try to have an encounter the second way and the way that we like it so much that's our number one strategy and that's by being in those areas but bringing elk to us okay and instead of us having to find them, we try to get them to find us. So let's go through the first set, all right? And that would be number one, spot and stalk using the silent treatment. And I know a lot of guys that do this, they don't call at all, right. all right? And if if the terrain allows, now this is tough. If you're, if you're up in some of that thick Idaho country, you know, you get up in that Idaho country, and, and I don't know this personally. I've never seen it, but I've had so many of my buddies in that country say that you're not going to find an area that you can use the glasses and be able to see. It's just way too thick. Take but him. out here in New Mexico, you can definitely find high glassing points that allow yeah. for you to cover areas. And make sure when you do that, try to find those points where you get the most coverage, you know, where you can see into two different drainages where you can see all along a side like that. Mm -hmm. So th mm -hmm. that, that's the number one way to do that. Secondly would be spot, stock, and call. Yep. Now, I, I'll tell you this, if you use the spot, stock, and call, be careful not to show up unannounced and then be visually invisible. Yeah. What, do you, what do you think I mean by that? Visually invisible means that you're blending in with the with the uh the hunting area but you're not being you're not announcing your presence so it's gonna be yeah. real gonna be real hard for them to find you if you're not announcing your presence well but here here's the here's the other thing that i mean by that is is you know you've got a whole bunch of cows that are in in a park or in an area where you got trees and it's pretty doggone open and you sneak in amongst them a hundred yards and all of a sudden you cow call and they're oh, looking man. where you the cow call. Is, yeah, there ain't no cow there. Ain't no cow there. They get and nervous. Of, yeah, and all of a sudden they show I mean, you showed up unannounced. It wasn't like right. you brought that cow to them, right? They right, didn't right. think there was cow. And all of a sudden you give a cow call, and they look, and there's nothing mm -hmm. there. Yeah. That's what I mean by. Look, look if you stock it. You stalk in on a set like that and you get in the middle of them, you don't need to say a word. Absolutely. You, you just got to shut up, read their body languages and where they're going to go. Try to keep the wind in your favor and keep moving until you figure out, you know, A, are we killing a cow or are we killing any legal elk? <laughs> I mean, we got to figure that out first. But if we're in the middle of them, man, they are in serious trouble. You know, uh, you have now gotten into their circle and all you got to do is be patient find the right one and, and close the deal and remember so, y'all go ahead cole joe i was curious um so when you say like spot stock call mm -hmm. um are you intending on using a call to approach so that they just think you're another elk you know the elk are there even though you're not they're not responding to you right. but you announce your presence far off and then maybe again when you get a little closer. Not then necessarily. When you, get a, yeah. you can okay. do that, but not necessarily. But what you want to do, though, is milk. you don't want to get into a point where you haven't introduced yourself. And then all of a sudden, you're. It, it's kind of like when a bull even comes over. Like if you're calling and they come into an open area and they know they should see another elk. N now they're like... Um, they're looking and, and remember they always want to see visually right so yeah. if they want to see visually and they're not seeing anything they get nervous man because they should mm -hmm. see it now what i'm saying is if you're going to spot stock call it might be a situation where you can actually now get into a good position where maybe you can't get any closer for that shot that gilbert's talking about but mm -hmm. i might be able to now 
throw some real quiet calls back behind me and be in a situation where I'm screened, where I can see a yeah. little bit what's going on through there, but they're not able to see me. So it's not like they're looking in an area that they should see another elk. They're looking and they hear the sound of an elk, but they're screened from it. So now it has a different effect. Now you can actually start introducing some things that are going on mm -hmm. behind you to get that in a slow play. And bring them to yeah. you. Yes, absolutely. In, in, a, in a real I, slow play deal, you know, so yeah. he gets more curious. And like Joe said, a lot of times less is more and he gets curious and then he'll ease on across that opening or whatever. But the minute you challenge him or the minute you, you know, you start really doing something wild, he's going to be like, where in the hell is this herd that I'm hearing? You know, I, I don't see it. So they get real, real skittish. But I think if you drop off, like Joe says, and even even if you move away from him and he ain't seen you, a lot of times that slow play of doing that will cause and him to. And that's solo. If you're with yeah. a partner. Yeah. And you he have needs to go stock up in getting yeah. great shooting position yeah. and now you're back behind him you can see him getting position you're still visually decent, seeing the yeah. animals and now you can actually use the terrain and use sure. the, the the vegetation no to pull him back so it's yeah. more of a you know you have visually found the animal and you can get in position to be able to get a kill on those animals and we've done that go ahead manano i i remember i asked that specific question we were stalking uh in uh a uh, particular uh, mountain so as we go joe started calling cow calls and cow calls and cows while we were walking right and i asked hey joe okay so we're three guys moving in the woods announcing our presence here i mean you're cow calling while we were we walking so we're doing hey we're here and re i remember you explained me that so yeah, that, yeah, that was my concern. I mean, it was my first trip, and I was, hey, yo, can we stop and get behind a tree? <laughs> yeah, and... you want to be silent. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he wanted to be quiet. We were like, yeah. no, screw yeah. that, man. Let's go in. So, yeah. you know, actually, so actually, that was that was his answer, Manano. Screw that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I tell you what, Joe. I listened to a podcast with Paul Medell um, uh -huh. on my way up to watch my daughter play ball, and. Uh, Man, if you haven't listened to that guy and his scenarios, oh yeah, absolutely pretty serious, pretty I, I, doggone serious to understand what and when to how, how to get a bull from hanging up to you know coming to you. It's, it's pretty special. Absolutely, man. Yeah, and love Paul Medell and the Elton Nut guys. I, I actually was listening to him on our buddy uh, buddy's podcast from Western Contours. There, Mister yep. Duplanche. Uh, it was really good, man. Yeah. Really? Yeah. No, it, awesome. And, and the, the situation that Manon was talking about is a little different in that yeah. we never had eyes on those bulls. Sure. They never had eyes on us. So we're moving through real thick area and noise. they're still off a ways where they're screened. So we were going to get in a good setup position. Remember, I truly believe that the, one of the number one reasons most guys don't finish is because they don't know how to set up properly. That's and, right. you know, we'll, we'll be talking about that more at another point so that's what i mean by spot stock and call you're using you're using your ability to get in tight but either with a partner getting in way in tight and good shooting position that's right off of them and sometimes when you're back there sometimes if you see that he's going to get a shot you just shut up you know yeah. or you need to distract an animal and you're back there where you can distract him a little bit or you can turn him because you know, Cole, you know as well as I do that you can turn a bull from one side to the other by throwing your calls from one side to the other, right? Not just that. I, I'll throw a log or a rock or something, you know, to – sometimes I don't even use a call. Sometimes I'll just use something that's around me and just make a hoof sound, you know, back behind me or to one side or the other for sure. Yeah, I mean, I remember one time me and the Ninja Chavez right there, we uh, snuck up into a herd. <laughs> we saw him, and uh, we snuck right in there in their kitchen, brother. It was so cool. Had the wind, sick, sickled right up in there in them. And, I mean, before you know it, the whole herd surrounding us. And uh, these bulls knew that there was a cow in the area because we had, we had cow called a little bit as we approached. And they were in a big pack together, right? And they just, they, they knew there was a cow over there. And I had a barrier okay a, a barrier that they needed to come across these bulls walked within 12 feet 
uh, I'm talking 12 feet now of me and Chab. Okay. That's awesome. And they walk in front of us and they got nervous because they didn't see what they needed to see. But the whole time, Joe has taught me so much about throwing my, my bugles and throwing my cow calls behind me, right? So the whole time I've hit them with something and it's away from me. So, man, they are getting ultra curious. Well, the biggest one got real nervous because he hadn't seen a cow yet, right? And he just decided he was going to freaking load them up and get them out of there. And, man, I just ripped off a nasty bugle. <laughs> man you know behind me and that locked them all up they're all like oh man there is a cow over there now there's another bull so i mean but this all took place what do you what do you say chav it took us an hour hour and a half while they were while they were there a long, I mean, long time but did we did approach it with some call calls so yeah. uh that kind of calmed them down yeah and it was, it was inter interesting seeing the behavior of the bulls because the there's a couple of dumb ones <laughs> that wanted to come right away, but but well, one was playful and kept keeping them in the area, and the smart one just took off. Actually, just walked away. Remember, one walked yeah, away. He did. Yeah. And then finally, the, the the two dumb ones jumped jumped the fence and gave you the shot. Shame on them. Yeah. <laughs> but look, man. I mean, we could have blew that up real simple. Oh, but yeah. it was that it was that soft cow call, and even when they were in our face, man, I remember when they they were. You know, that bull got within like 21 yards and he pressed his chest up against the bob wire. And I'm like, oh, this is it. He's going to jump it right here, 21 yards. And they got all wigged out because that other bull hit him in the butt with his horns and everything. And they all got all wigged out and everything. And so, again, we just let them settle down a little bit and I softly cow called away from us, you know. And uh it it sparked that curiosity again it's another one of those slow pay play scenarios and when they all got wigged out i just said well you know I'm, if i'm gonna blow it up i'm gonna blow it up real and uh, i hit that bugle and that locked them up and here they came and then boink one jumped and boink the other one jumped i'm like oh yeah here it goes. <laughs> I, 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 i'm yelling at chap how far because <laughs> and he goes 18 yards i'm like what <laughs> they look like a stack <laughs> down there i mean they're a long way finally he goes he goes 58 yards i'm like that's mo better <laughs> you know? and, and yeah, that's, that's, that's mo an better that's we an finished important it. point about those range finders too yeah. guys is yeah. man, Click, click, is, click, click. Yeah, you better click, click them because they can pick up grass. They can pick up a branch. That's what we were on our knees, Joe, and there yeah. was a lot of big grass in, in our and way. Give you a bad read, man. So yeah. it's that's real critical on that. So we've done the spot and stock silent treatment. Yeah. We did the spot and stock with the calling. And I'll tell you the biggest lesson I learned from that when I talked about the visually invisible right there is that I actually stalked in within, <laughs> man, I was within 15 yards of this herd bull and his cows but i had the cows in front of me and the herd bull was off on the other side mm -hmm. so instead of being smart and waiting you know because i had the wind had everything in my favor no joe's got to call everything in you know? <laughs> yeah. so, so i i give a cow call and i'm like and i'm like oh it's over he's gonna come right over here you know like mm -hmm. that i give a cow call everything goes whoo, like this jumps up and pow, out of there man i mean that bull went over and just Woo, got him out of there so fast because there was nothing there and all of a sudden this bush it was like the singing bush out of the what, what the three Bible. amigos man yeah, <laughs> you know? <right>. so, <laughs> yeah they were like no that ain't right and it was completely unnatural there was yeah. nothing that was environmental or natural about it remember that so what cole was talking about before when he talked about how you know could you have done some calling as you were coming in now had it been a situation where I have a bull that's sounding and I and he's sounding from the same place over yeah. and over yeah. and over. Yeah. Yes, yeah. then I'm going to call myself to that bull. I'm going to let him know I'm coming to him. But if I have a visual and I have somebody and I can stalk into a certain thing, I don't even want them to have a clue I'm there until mm -hmm. we're in position and we're ready. But I got to mm -hmm. remember how to do this in a natural way. You can't mm -hmm. just call straight at him you can't be loud you got to throw things or you got to team up all right so the next one is still hunting and what and you know a lot of people that hunt whitetail that hunt muleys this is their game right there or set and wait you know mm -hmm. in other words because we're not we're not 
creating opportunities we're waiting for opportunities to happen in in their time and in their place you're going to use your knowledge and do the mohican sneak in to be yeah. where they're going to be at specific times or locations in that bedroom wallow water food source main trail and you're going to travel or set up on those areas or locations that give you and the reason you're doing this is like we said in the location you want to be where you have the highest odds at an encounter or wait for the encounter at the high odds area and hope that an opportunity presents itself y'all so um one thing i'm going to just tell you though is me um when, when i play poker you can either wait for hands yeah and you're going to get a great hand every i don't know uh you might get three great hands in five minutes but then you're going to get a great hand every half hour every two hours the best poker players win hands without waiting on the cards they yeah. create their opportunities they create their odds okay what are you smiling about my i see you laughing I'm, after, bro. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just remember every single time you, you hear a bugle a bugle at 6 30 p.m you create that opportunity you create that moment <laughs> <laughs> you will go there now let's you talk about those areas man <laughs> let's talk about where you're going to wait and because this is, if you're going to wait or if you're going to be in those high odds areas, there's some things that I think is real important to talk about. And that's like, number one, water sources or wallows. Okay. And first of all, understand what I'm going to describe here is me. This is because I know a lot of people have been successful waiting at water and waiting at wallows. Okay, but he would not do that. But I, <laughs> I'm telling you straight out. He's sending no tree stand. I, no, friggin' ADD man. So no, hey. private property, private property, water, and and wallows is way different than public land. No doubt. Okay, because those main water holes that everybody has spotted that you can see on maps and that have got marked after day one when all that pressure starts going around those water holes them animals they done figured it out right yeah, and yeah. they're not going to show up so yeah, first of all understand this not all water holes or wallows have the same value the more secluded the better all right if it's one that you're seeing on a map that everybody else is seeing then you know, you can be there waiting and you're going to see one hunter show up and you're going to wave and they're going to say, oh, somebody's already here. Then you're going to see another hunter show up and you're going to wave and go, oh, somebody's already sitting here, right? And all that sense around there. And you know what? Elk are going to drink at that water hole. But they're not going to drink in the morning when you're sitting it and they're not going to drink in the evening when you're sitting it. They're going to drink in the dark before the sun comes up and they're going to drink in the dark after the sun goes down. Yeah. Okay. And and they're going to travel distances to do that. So the more secluded, the better. Water sources with a wallow or multiple wallows, especially a water source that is hidden, that has multiple wallows, that is a hot ticket. Yeah. All right. If you see where they're hitting that, and the way you can tell when, a, how do you guys tell when a wallow is being hit? It's dark. It it's it's mur murky. It's got to be murky and turned yeah. up. Yeah, turned yeah. up and murky. And, and you'll actually see sometimes when they get in there, you'll smell it. mud sprayed oh, all yeah. over everything, yeah. you know, because yeah. they're getting that mud on them like that. Um, the closer to or on the way to bedding areas, the better. In other words, if it's in, if it's a water source in that travel corridor, that's a better water source to be on because now they can leave in the morning from where they're at and they can hit that on their way going through that travel corridor or the closer the water is to areas that combine bedding as well as preferred parks meadows or certain feet especially man if you find a wallow near bedding areas buddy yeah that's man, hot take. that's money yeah it's money man because the best time the best time to be at a wallow or a secluded waterhole is not in the morning or in the evening it's midday yeah. Okay. Absolutely midday. And 
but let, let me, before I go on, just so you know where I'm coming from, look, I've killed 36 elk in the last 38 years. I have never killed an elk over water, ever. And, and it's not because I haven't waited there. I mean, I've been in some of their great evening hunts, especially, man, if you're tired and you've had a long day, it's like, well, I'll sit water this evening and you have a chance at it. But I can tell you, if it is something that people can see, it's not gonna happen. And I think it's the best way to sit water is if it's water that you can have a vantage point away where you can glass the area and see the animal come in and then move in or do something like that, okay? Yeah. Um, Exposed water holes, once the pressure begins, can become a bust, man. The secluded, the better. But they only, elk only need to drink twice a day. And with pressure, like I said, they're going to drink, and then they're going to be that mile to three miles away, and that's where they're going to be doing their rutting, their feeding, their bedding. They're going to do it in an area where they're not catching all that. And then they're going to go catch those places that night. So, Joe, can, can elk skip days for drinking? I mean, if no. they're eating, uh, like, a really green and freshy... Uh, if grass. they're getting moisture from the grass, they're getting moisture from the grass, um, and there's so, different places that they can get it. I mean, if it, you know, if it's rained or something like that, they can get yeah. a lot of that moisture that's going to help them go longer. But I don't know if you've ever seen an elk drink, dude. It is like a friggin'. It, have you ever seen what a shot back does to a bucket, a five gallon bucket? Yeah. <laughs> they like got a siphon. Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, absorb it through osmosis. They will friggin' just suck it up, man. I mean, they'll they'll just I mean, they'll be like five minutes if they can, and just sucking it up and fill that belly up, man. Mm -hmm. When they get there, uh, now the, the of course the best time to be able to find a bull on any kind of water is going to be on those hot days, and if you can find those secluded, especially near bedding you know, those wallows or water that are close to bedding and you're there at midday between 10 and three, that is a hot ticket. Okay. Yeah. That, that's the places. And, and look, you can use it in this way. If, if you're trying to find elk and people are waiting on the water holes, then look on your map and try to find those gaps that are a mile to three miles between those water holes in those gaps and that's most likely where they're bedded where they're rutting and when they're feeding they're close okay? right yeah. so there there's a there's a huge nugget for you right there now let's talk about that's 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 water anybody have anything to add about water Go no I, like i said i think a public land water is much different than private land absolutely water, you know so um you guys that hunt private ranches Y'all know where your elk are watering most of the time. So um, you, I know a lot of guys that have private ranches. They put up ground blinds or they put up game camps. Uh, bow blinds, you know, uh, do what? Game camps. Yeah, game camps. Yeah. And they can almost time them rascals coming in there. Same thing with wallows and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, just a little if, different than, if, than. If you take Joe to. Bermejo or whatever, and <laughs> he would never see it in a blind. No, <laughs> no, you don't have to there. Yeah, and just going going back to the you mentioned that they uh, like to drink water from ten to three. Uh, if they're in a really isolated area that there's seldom people that go in the area, maybe because of a dull burn or there's no cover of any kind. Uh, and there happens to be a water hole right in the middle of all that. They could show up at noon. Uh, I remember that one time we were, our hunt was over. We were, we were packing our, the truck and, and I kept hearing a bugle and I go, it's 92 degrees and we're out 92. here in the middle of nowhere. And all of a sudden here comes a herd right over the mountain. You know, I, I got a thousand pictures of this nice bull because <laughs> our, our bulls were already packed. So I had my camera out, but he came and watered 92 degrees and he had a herd with him. Wow. And it was uh, in the middle of nowhere, basically, that you would think elk would be at. Yeah. Uh, but, he, but he watered anyway. Yeah. And now, if you want to wait specific food sources, you know, and what I mean by that a lot of times is there's, if there is certain fields or ag areas that these guys are traveling from public onto private to get that, you can locate worn trails that are funneled down for them to get to those food sources 
And and I tell you, the best time to kill an elk is not when they're coming from a private place. It's when they're going to it because elk have, I've talked about their fatal flaws. And here's another habit of theirs that is pretty regular, is that when an elk comes from an area, he knows that that location that he just walked from is safe. When something happens, if they get boogered or they get shot, when they're actually getting boogered, they don't know what happens to them. They will go the way they came Dang. because they know it's safe. Mitchell. So that, that's why, you know, you got to be real careful about being on any kind of fence line that you're not able to retrieve an animal on the other side. Because yep. if you have an animal that comes over and you shoot that animal, the first location almost, almost all the time, there's all kinds of things that can happen. But most of the time, they're going to turn and go back the way they came. Same thing yeah. as when you call a bull in that comes over, you know, and, and you're not in good position using that terrain. Comes over the top of the hill, and it's, if there's 100 yards within the trees that he can see, and he stopped up there. And you're down there, and he stops, and he's scanning, and he's scanning. You're not able to say anything because you, you might peg yourself, so you just sit there and watch. Watch that bull. He's going to turn. He'll walk back the exact way he came over that hill. So now what do you do? Well, <laughs> you know, it, it's funny because I have done this, man. I've learned from this mistake. I'm like, well, I can get him to come in again. So I'll call. He comes exactly the same way he came, stopped yeah. in the exact same place and looks. So who wasn't being smart? The elk or me? Yeah. So now the <laughs> third time the bull goes over the hill, run up. Get to him where he was. Him. Throw your call back, and that bull will come over to the exact spot that he knows it's safe and take that look. So that's just something that, that you can learn about their behavior. Yeah, they might do that like two or three times. After that, you've lost your chance. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, you know, make sure that you find those trails that are going to food sources that are up and that are funneled that a lot of them will feed. They'll come down off of finger ridges. They'll hit those funnels and they'll go right in. They like to approach a lot of times because of common winds and different things and features that have happened and come in the same ways. Maybe they just hit water from a certain area, but you can definitely find those trails. Now, bedrooms, man. Um, bedrooms are also a great place to be in or spot and stalk yourself through there. And you find those worn trails as you go through. And this is where you're going to put that Mohican sneaking on a man. And you're going to go stealthy and slow. Now, this is if you're just trying to, you know, create your odds in areas that elk are going to be. And you're going to want to be in those bedrooms from 10 to 3. All right. Mm -hmm. That's. You know, I, I think a lot of those guys, like Chad said, sometimes they'll get up at 2 o'clock and go get some water or push the herd or yeah. get moving and start feeding. It depends, especially if it's a moonlit night. If it's a moonlit night, they're getting up earlier. If yeah. it's if it's not, they might stay in the bed a little bit longer. Okay? So that's, that's really huge for you to remember. Bedrooms. Look, here's another thing that I always remind myself is, I don't know if it's ever happened to you guys, but you, you went hunting in an area and you moved through pretty quick and you came back through and you looked down and there's a track in your track. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I used to Three same times. thing call, calling in a set, you know, uh -huh. a lot of times we get impatient, you know, all we called for, you know, 10 minutes and we want to move on when instead of giving it 30, you know, right. and but by the, when you get ready to turn around and go, Boom, there's a bull coming in. He's already seen you move the whole nine yards. Happened to me several times. It's yep. about being patient, you know, and believing in the area and you know you're around them. The early if, season, these bulls are going to come in silent a lot of times. You've got to you give them an opportunity. I'm sorry, bro. I didn't mean to kill That's you. Okay. If you don't want to see the track of an elk in your track, <laughs> don't be so quick to leave your yeah. traps. Okay. Yeah slow down i mean if that's what if you are still hunting that's what the word still means now uh if you just want to cover country and hope that you see something booger it that's a strategy as well absolutely we've done that <laughs> we run and gun like that brother i guarantee when you get on the heels of the master yep. it's about covering seven ridges in front of you you're gonna make it happen and you and know. this last strategy you've seen friends of ours use and i know it's very very effective I do not have the patience to do it, but y'all, yeah. tree stands 
on a yeah. main trail or travel route, especially yeah. something that funnels between morning and evening destinations, can be killer. Now, it might take five, six days of sitting that on that mm-hmm. trail before you get something. I mean, you got to be ready to spend long hours and have patience. Who knows? It might be day one that that mm-hmm. happens. But yep. tree stands can be prime if you find the right place to put them. And this is something where maybe a trail cam showing elk moving constantly on a trail will give you a clue. I've mm-hmm. never used a trail cam ever in my life. And, and a lot of that's because I don't have anything to again them. But number one, great uh, tools. I, I, I didn't, it, when it came from money, spending them on arrows or, or yeah, trail, cams, yeah. trail cams, mm-hmm. it was, it was going to go to the stuff I hunt with. Um, got the food, we had to get bologna or peanut butter. You know, Till you met the <laughs> Venezuelan mafia. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Life changed as you know it right there. So do not discount tree stands. I mean, you guys that, that do those tree stands, man, can be, you know, Imagine tree stands in the chute, Gilbert. Oh, my God. I was about to say, I, I didn't oh, want to just mention it. I, I didn't want to mention it. Yep. But uh, that's my, yeah. I mean, my dream. And, and it, it's just an area that elk funnel. Everything, yeah. the way the terrain goes, when they Falls want to get into from... That- yeah, it's... they want to. They have areas where they get food and water and go into bed, and it naturally funnels them to this one trail. That I mean, it looks like. A I guarantee if you set fourteen sets there on a seven-day hunt, morning yep. and evening, or even all-day sets, one of those days, you're going to kill a giant because he's going to be coming through there with yep. that herd, yeah. and but... it may be multiples too. Sure. I mean, yep. be crazy. <laughs> The problem is, is I love to call elk, man. Me too. Just, Me just, too. Same. So I get in a tree stand and an elk screams off, man. I'm going. Yeah. yeah I'm out. I'm shimmy. Yeah, it's that a thing. whole yeah, different we're going, man. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we've talked about those in, 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 our, in our tool belt right there, yeah. right? So let's talk about the second way. Let's talk about our number one strategy, and that's to be in those same destinations those same travelers, those same travel corridors, but instead of waiting on the elk to come across us, we're going to find the elk. We're going to get them to find us. We want to bring them to us. We're going to create our opportunities. And how do we do that? Calling. 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 Heck yeah, man. Elk vocalizations. And, you know, the problem is, though, is let's define the calling because I'm not going to say calling. I'm going to say elk vocalizations. And the reason mm-hmm. I'm going to say that is most people, as soon as you hear about calling elk, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Bugle, Bugle tail call. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and, and so what do you think is like, let's say that I give a cow call, no response. I give a location bugle, get a response. What do you think the first reaction is? from 90 percent of the hunters out there once they get a response to a location bugle they will reply harder again, yeah. instead of going there yeah they scream at scream them at like it. It, yeah. it's it's like it's why like, would you want to offer to fight him you know he just told you where he's at but everybody watches all the videos man and mm. and it's kind of like my niece Lene when she mm. was setting the hook on this fish that finally bit yeah <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's like she's been fishing this whole time right and you're fishing and you're fishing and fishing and all of a sudden you get a little bit of nibble and man it's like <laughs> like that right right literally and, and i hope His i lips hope off, Joe. Oh, she ripped the lips off the fish so and, and so many people do that is they're, they, they've been going and going and going and going. They finally get this response and it's like, oh my, my, and I mean, they just yeah. like challenge that thing right away, mm-hmm. man. Right. He gave you a location, man. He's telling you, come on. You Absolutely. Know, let's, let's go. So got to cut the distance down, boys. Yep. Okay. Right. So, so let me set the tone here then. This is what the elk bros do. We're going to talk about, this is what we do. This is how yeah. we do it. We call it herd talk, Joe. And well, yeah, man. And it's not like, it's not like 
it doesn't mean there aren't other ways to do this. There's a lot of successful people that do things different. I'm giving you our playbook, right? Yeah. And there's there's two things it that works. you got to remember when you use our way is that if you're not hearing an elk respond to your call, calls or vocalizations, that doesn't mean that there are no elk. I think Agreed. that I think a lot of people cover country and they're just location bugle, location bugle, location bugle. And when they do that and they don't hear anything, they're like, there's no well, elk. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. And, and just because you don't hear a response, like I said, early doesn't mean that they're not responding. It's just that they can be coming into you and here you are, you, you give a location bugle and an elk hears it and like, Oh, and you give another one. They're like, Oh, and they start coming. Right. What if they're 400 yards off? And yeah, you don't you hear left. nothing. Yeah. By the time that elk gets there, you're already a half mile down the freaking road. Yeah. Right? Okay. So don't think that they're not responding. All right. Now, Give does, them that, time. does that mean you have to wait someplace for an hour after every call? No, it doesn't. But if you are setting up on something where you smell animals or you, you see heard, signs. Yeah. Right. If you have sign, yeah. man. And, and you're going to give something there, like you decide you're going to do a setup, then understand that if you you got to commit time to that. Yeah, it's at least 30 minutes, Joe. Yes. Sometimes 45, depending. If you get an answer, yeah, you're going to probably spend 45 minutes figuring it out, you know. So, so let's say you have a bull that chuckled to you up on the side of a hill, right? Mm -hmm. um, or he just gives one of those, and you know how that goes. You guys have all, it's just like... Uh, sounds like yeah. a dead cow you yeah know? it's more of a grunt yeah <laughs> and you hear, it's, that, it's that lazy sound from the dead right if yeah. you hear that and you decide okay i'm gonna do a setup and you never hear nothing else out of them that does not mean that animal's not coming in exactly okay grinders tuning in thank you for listening to the blue collar elk hunting podcast our goal is to share our knowledge and help you flatten that learning curve so that you too can have some of the very same incredible experiences that have given all of us here at Elk Bros a lifetime of memories. If you like what you hear or see, you can get all of this information plus so much more from our Base Camp Elk Hunting Training Camp, the first in a series of online courses from our Blue Collar Elk Academy. Our Base Camp Training Camp allows me to use my coaching style and share almost 40 years of elk hunting experiences successfully hunting elk on public lands as well as over 20 years guiding hunters of all ages and experience levels. This course will be like nothing you have ever experienced in concept and structure using success-based coaching techniques that will elevate your confidence and skill sets. Our camp will prepare you specifically from that final moment most in your control, those final minutes or seconds the elk is in front of you, backwards through each step and level, allowing you to see, visualize, understand, and relate every coaching point to what lies ahead, the next step, the next thought process, the next success. Because y'all, you've already been there. You know what it looks like. By tapping my 30 years of teaching and coaching experience, our camps are developed considering multiple learning modes with text, visuals, audio, as well as video. And base camp will benefit those new to elk hunting all the way to the 10 to 15 year vet. So if you are looking for that one thing to help you fill that tag this year, invest in the most important piece of equipment there is, you and your elk hunting knowledge. You can find the Blue Collar Elk Hunting Academy and the Base Camp Training Camp at elkbros.com. That's E-L-K-B-R-O-S dot com. Keep dreaming of the screaming, believing and achieving, and most of all, keep grinding. All right. Exactly. Um, yeah. So there's a couple things about our system. Our system doesn't really change from pre-rut to rut. It's the same system, but it's all about the response that dictates what we do from there, our follow-up strategies. And I will tell you, if you have, you know, if you haven't listened to us before, we are lovers before we are fighters always. We always introduce a cow first. 
and then we're going to read if that pushes buttons and then we're going to go from there and when we do introduce our cow calls we're going from near to far so when i say that we're going near to far that means it's like first we're doing it just with the mouth just with the mouth like that different directions if we don't get anything there then the next one we're going through the tube okay we don't get anything from there now i can find out even farther and how do i reach farther that should have come across. yeah definitely yo straight up location baby and, and look I'll tell you this, that's what you call, that was like a two-tone location view. Yeah. Most of the time, I don't even two-tone it, man. It's uh -uh. just single tone Woo! broadcast. <laughs> and I'll go that long, man. And I'll go from Florida all the way up to Michigan when I do it, man. Yeah. Right? And I'm just giving that. <laughs> because that's what they're hearing. Right. They're not. They're not hearing those lower tones if they're that far they're off. Too far off. Okay? Right. And and I, I've talked about my double bugle that I use there. And there's certain time and place that I'll throw that out. I don't do it all the time, um, but mainly, especially if I've got a bull that's been responding and he kind of doesn't, then I'll use that double bugle. And and the reason I use that double bugle is to make him think that I'm not engaging him, that there's two other bulls. And if he hears two other bulls, then he thinks there's a hot cow, he's going to respond. Okay, so um, a lot of that real fast right in that. But we're going to call near to far. And when we do it, there's natural timing and amount. So in other words, it's not like I'm on a hoochie mama. <laughs> Uh, you know, I mean, just throwing that just broken like record. That. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Now, I can tell you this. There are times when I do give that annoying one, like if I'm doing a lost cow lost or a cow lost calf, calf yeah. as something's moving, I'll give those. Or if I'm like doing like I'm moving in on a bull, I'm calling to that bull, trying to sound yes. like a excited cow coming in. Yeah, I might do something like that. But if I'm going through the woods, my rhythm is going to be something like this. <laughs> So you can hear different levels in different directions. I've bumped into people that have told me, I've asked, have you seen anything? And they said, no, but I just heard a whole herd moving through here. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, I've told them, no, dude, that, that was me. And they're like, no, 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 this was a herd. I heard a herd coming through yeah. right over here five minutes. We know, you know? we know, bro, we know. <laughs> yeah, which so, is what we tell them, we know. Because, we know. because they have a cadence, right? Yeah. it's everything is it's not on our time we try to rush every single step of the game you know there's so much at stake that we're trying to push to have success right when really right. we should probably slow down and think like if this was really an l yeah they might only make a call or two every 30 to 45 seconds and that might even be a lot no, that's, yeah. yeah, absolutely, man, because a lot of times what you have to do is you have to remember what, what am I reaching? And because of terrain, um, because of the terrains that's there, what am I reaching or, um, or the distance that I'm reaching it? So it's kind of like what I want to do is as I get to a new area where I know that my sound hadn't reached before, I'm going to reach out again. Okay, exactly. so it's not where I'm just going to go, go, go like that. I want to sound like a natural herd moving through. In order to do that, I can't just be like screaming. Now, I, I can tell you there's a certain time like after a herd has been boogered and they get into the trees when you're going to hear, or if they're out in a meadow and they've lost their calf, they're going to car, you know, start doing all this yelling out there because there's so many elk and they're looking for their calf. You know, there's, there's different times vocalizations happen like that. But, and a bull... Guys, look, when a bull is really sounding off, a lot of time people think that that bull is, is running away and he's sounding off, sounding off, sounding off. As soon as a bull hits the trees with his cows, he is sounding off so the cows know where he's where at he as he's moving. He's trying to keep them with him, right? Mm -hmm. Because he's on the back end of that and it's like, I'm here, 
I'm here yeah. and I'm yeah. Big Daddy. If you're hearing those guys over there, don't be going with them, right? Yeah. So you, you just got to do that. And so when people say, where do you call from and when? Now, when I'm doing cow calls, if, if I'm moving through an area, like if, if I'm not getting any reaction, then I'm going to sound like a small group of cows working cross ridge or the ridge knuckles as much as possible. Now, I've heard some hunters don't like to do this because they say that as they're going, all of a sudden they look up and there's an elk there. Well, here's, here's my philosophy on that. I would much rather have an elk, have an opportunity to see an elk that came in on me and was going to surprise me. I might, I would want that opportunity to see that animal than to go through that area and have never seen an animal when there's an animal there. So, yeah. because I get immediate feedback from that. I uh, get heck, some man. reassurance. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You get a confirmation. Absolutely. It's a confirmation, actually. If Absolutely. there's one, there there's is more. more. There's Absolutely, more. man. And, and here's the other thing. So as soon as I find an elk in an area, that tells me there are elk in that area. And trust me, if you mark that you came across an elk in a certain spot, you better be marking it because I guarantee you that if you've seen them once there, there's a good chance they're going to be there again. Yeah. Okay. Uh, like Chav said in the last podcast, Chav, you were talking about when you come across an elk carcass or when you come across tape in the tree, like when somebody marks a trail from a kill. Mm -hmm. That tells you that elk were in an area that they got killed there. It, it could be a it could be a cat kill, it could be a bear kill, but that means that there were elk in the area, and elk like to frequent the same areas. If a cat found an elk in a particular area or a bear found one there, they were waiting there because they, like us, know that their prey was going to be there. They had good odds at finding them there. Yeah. All right. You know, Joe, I, I go back to when you and Chav and I hunted a couple of years back and we ran into to your buddy and his son. I mean, a lot of people would have thought the elk hunt was done then, you know, when they were saying, well, we hadn't hadn't seen anything, hadn't heard very much at all. And, you know, we knew we were in an area that had them there. Right. right. And uh, they just weren't talking a lot. And as soon as we we had actually set up and did a little calling after they left us and uh did a little calling and kind of got impatient and took off and when we took off here here come the all dumbs and dumber uh they were all <laughs> headed right for us you know i mean seriously it, it was like i looked up and man I, I got to stuttering and stammering and i wanted to hit joe in the back because here they were coming you know it's all these bulls looking at us <laughs> but they were coming because of the set that we had right but right. we just they they were far enough away that you know uh we didn't wait long enough or we had them run over the top of us probably Joe. absolutely man and and i think a lot of people that do scenarios or sets or setups really a lot of times don't know how close they were to having an animal in their lap yeah 100 you know, percent. yeah i agree it, it, and, and joe you have a normal rule that you like to use when you do a setup like that as far as time yeah, you, you've got to say that you're going to commit 40 minutes minimum. If you're going to if you're going to set up and you're going to waste waste what you you know because if you leave early you wasted that time you didn't give yeah. it the opportunity. So I you know if I'm going to do one of those, I'm going to commit 40 for some kind of response, 40 minute, yeah. right? And if if I get a response of some kind, now I'm I mean I, I'm not going to stay in the set just because it depends on what's yeah. happening with that right, That's right. That's right. you know it, it yeah. could be that I can stay and they're still going to come in or maybe there's even more than one that's coming in like that. So, but you have to commit. So if you think you need to be someplace else, like in 15 minutes from now, then don't commit 15 minutes to a setup. Keep going to where you're going. All yeah. right, because you got to give it a chance to work. Um, now, I, I, I talked about how if, I, if I'm not getting any responses, I'm going to sound like a group of cows. In early season, when you're doing that, and I like to do it through the tube, where it's like... When you hear that, it's a little bit deeper. And then I'll 
keep doing that early season bulls mew to each other sure. their bow calls and so if you're doing that working a lot of bulls will come in silent to you it is our favorite early season technique to move across ridge through feeding areas like let's say you find trails that are going up from feeding areas up to bedding areas i like to work cross nice and relaxed and easy going across there and try to get that animal to sneak in on us and i'll tell manano i'll tell luis that, that's not a complete true joe <laughs> <If you like. laughs> what bro you're calling me out now <laughs> What's no, not you go, no you go straight to the peak <laughs> You don't go. <laughs> he ain't crossing no side. No. Here. Straight to the top. That's a BS. Well, it's because we heard a bull up there, man. So it's a little bit different story. But and then I, he goes in circles. <laughs> if I haven't heard anything, if I haven't heard anything, then I'm going to sound like a small group. A small group just throwing some of those out with that kind of timing. You're going to hear it. <laughs> Just like that, just sound like a little group throwing it to different directions, maybe even with the, the tube, okay? Makes them sound like a little bit different areas. Just in that kind of cadence, it's not. It's not that. You hear the different sound levels. You heard a little chirp, heard a little mute. Right? Okay, so varied. You know, make it more authentic when you do it. Give them okay. a little buzz, Joe. Yeah. Chatting back and forth. Yeah. yeah now, the reason I'm not using a buzz at that time is just because of that early season time of year. I, I mm -hmm. wait till I get something that, that's actually it's talking. Yep. Yeah. And deserving that buzz in that situation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, another one of the strategies that I do is especially now, let's say I've had bulls, and this will happen where you have bulls that you hear them out in the parks, right? And then they've gone up into the trees and all of a sudden they've shut up and it like hits that 8 39 o'clock mark nothing right so what i like to do at that point is i like to do the same thing i move up and level and i'm going across those knuckles and i'm going across the top of that and i'm not only making cow calls but i'm adding the as i'm doing that and as i'm moving so now I'm sounding like a frustrating bull that's got a cow that he's trying to, you know, that he'd like to breed with following them across. And the other bulls are going to hear that. And that's going to be incredibly attracting to them because I'm sounding like that bull that's trailing those cows. Going across. I'm frustrated, right? And it's not the same rodeo that they hear all the time. Okay. I can even do the glunking noises with it. Now, what I'm telling you here is what I call my general plan to where I'm doing calling. This is our general plan. This is like basically kind of the playbook. All right. It's just a general plan. So I'm doing my cow calls near to far. No reaction. I'm a small group of cows. Um, I might even if I had bulls that sounded off and shut up. Now I might sound like a small group of cows with a bull behind them that's frustrated. OK, now, if I still haven't had anything and I want to go up another level because I'm working to that two thirds level up there, that bedding area, then I'm going to do what I call an advertising bull with cows. So now I'm still going to do the cow but now I'm going to be doing that as I'm moving going up to that next level i am going to sound exactly like that bull that came out of the park trying to keep his ladies together as he's moving up to a bedding area and what happens with that is i'll end up with bulls that'll hear that mm -hmm. even cows that'll hear that mm -hmm. because when a bull is advertising he's advertising to other cows here's where we're at mm -hmm. and we're going up this way mm -hmm. and they will start coming in they will pinpoint my direction and they will start coming up to it mm -hmm. okay so that that is really cool and then when i get up to that level what i want to do is once i get there again 
think about this. What did I just imitate? I heard the elk moving up. Oh, I heard, yeah. Yeah. Go, going to a bed, right? Yeah, going to a destination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so once I get up there, why don't I stay there for a little while? Why don't yeah. I give a lazy call from my bed, yeah. right? The cows are pretty much going to shut up, but the mm. bull, knowing that he's got possible other cows that is yeah, following him, is yeah. going to give that, just that little... Hey, here I am. Just little lazy calls out of the bed, yeah. all right? So that, that's something that, that you need to remember. Now when I'm at that level and I've waited and nothing has happened there, I'm getting towards my midday, right? Yep. So now what's my strategy at midday? I'm going to go work through those bedding areas, and I'm going to cow call going through them. Think about it, Manano. Think about that one time that we worked. Yeah. We had worked an area, and then we dropped off because of the wind, came all the way around so that we could work we some back in. We circled back it just so that we could yeah. go through the bedding level. And what happened? Yeah. Don't deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we closed um, the seal. I mean, uh, I remember I was I was trying to go straight. And you go, hey, Manano, just – and I remember you took the little powder and, and – Try yeah. the wind, mm -hmm. and we said, no, no. You said, let's go around, and we, I don't know, it was a long walk. It was. It was a, it was a long walk. It was a hike. Always is a hike, Beto. <laughs> it's always. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> it's up all the time. Yeah. yeah. And so th we did that just so we could come back through where I knew a bedding area was. Right. And we yeah. started working through that slow cow calling, and all of a sudden, Manano's like, Yo. Yeah. yeah, and sure enough, man, that bull's coming right into us. And not only did the bull come into those cow calls, but yeah. I shoot the bull at, I don't know, 12, 12 15 yards. Yeah, that bull close. goes there, and a bear comes in. So we can shoot a bull and a bear like yeah, within yeah. 10 minutes, man, because yeah. the, the bears are coming. from the same spot. From the, from same, the same spot. spot. Exact yeah. same spot. Now, so now I'm going to work through those. But here's the other part of my playbook. As I'm doing any of this stuff, I'm going to react to smells, fresh sign. I'm going to be looking for parts of an animal. I'm not looking for a whole animal. I'm looking for tan patches. I'm looking for horizontal lines. I'm looking for ears. I'm looking for horns that get a glint off of it, right? And yeah, if, if I get a strong smell of an animal and I think that they're close by, then yeah, I'm going to do, I'm going to do a, a scenario yeah. right there, okay? So I'm always going to introduce that cow and I'm going to work with that first. And then I'm going to introduce a bull and we're going to have our own little scenario right there. If I've got multiple people like Gilbert, I can have Gilbert off. We can do things from different directions on different distances and have a good time. And it's a great way to spend a midday right there. Absolutely, man. Okay. So that's our, that's our general plan. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this up for you in the morning, in the midday, and in the afternoon, okay? And mm -hmm. understand that um, we have a general plan of how we do things, but we have a general day plan. So a lot of guys want to know where to start. You know, where do I go? You know, how high should I be? So let me just tell you what dictates that. The less information you have, then the higher you need to start, okay? And in other words, what I mean by that, um, if I don't know what the area features are, if I haven't heard a vocalization, if I haven't seen an animal, if I haven't smelled one, then I need to start higher. The reason I need to start higher is so that I'm hearing more right? I'm not just going through an area. I'm actually able to cover When you're higher, you can cover so much more ground. You can see things, you can hear things, you can do all of that from and higher. Also the, also the thermals. It what? Yeah. The, the thermals. thermals. Yeah, the thermals. Yeah, absolutely because of the thermals, man. Sure. You know, as that thermals are changing and they're starting to come up, just think, why do I want to be higher? Let's say that I do hear an animal and I hear that animal. Which direction if is that animal going to be going most likely? Going up. Going up. up. Now, 
you have to be careful because a lot of times while they first started to go up, the thermals are still coming down to them. That's so right. you got to make sure that you get on the downwind, downwind the side of them. The little side of them. Yeah. Yeah. And and what I mean by that is I, I want you to see I want you to see my hand. Okay. So my hand, this is a thermal going up, going down. Okay. Now what happens is as you get a wind that comes from a side, it bends the thermal. Okay. Because so I could have a scent that's coming and let's say I have an elk right here, but I have this wind going like this. I know that if that wind's going, it can bend that thermal. So where I want to be is where that on that downwind inside, thermal yeah. side so that my scent is going to miss an animal all right it works both ways think of a stream like when when water goes around a rock it bends and it flows a different flow it's the same thing the wind does with that change the course yes yeah. it changes the course so our general day plan in the morning again the less i know now in other words let's say that i've heard okay we'll do it like this best case scenario i've got a bull located before daylight and responsive okay um, maybe in my scouting, I put one to bed, and so I'm, I'm able um, to uh, already know that I have a bull located before daylight. He's responding to me. Now, the first thing I have to do is I have to determine, is that bull with cows or is that a lone bull? If it is a bull with cows, then in my head, my first thought is that I want to prepare to parallel same level in the destination direction of that group and most likely and i've seen them not do this but most likely they're going to go with the thermal with the wind because they that's their defense mechanism so if i'm hearing a, a bull and i know and i'm hearing him and let's say i got multiple bulls that are screaming i know there's a hot cow i know that that bull's got cows or i hear him do roundup bugles or i hear him doing clunking that's a huge thing right there if i'm yeah. hearing clunking right i know that that's a bull tending cow yeah so now I, you, yeah, now yeah and, that, and that yeah. wind is there i don't want to come up behind that critter I don't want to go with my nose in the wind straight up his rear end because I'm going to end up chasing them behind them, and that's not what I want. I'm going to try to get on the downwind thermal side of him, and I'm going to try to get to their level because I know either I'm going to be able to get where I can call them to my same level, or if they start going up and I stay on their level, I now have the opportunity to make a move on them, all right? So... Yeah. If I have a bull that sounds out before daylight and is responsive and I figure he's with cows, I've got to be prepared to parallel that booger. Now, if a lone bull lights up, then I'm going to look for the best setup location I can find. And I can tell by his temperature. You know, in, in, your, in your piece that you just did, in your video on Flatlander Cole, yeah. how did you know that you guys needed to set up? Because you had that bull sounding off down below you, right? Yes. Um, well, first we we got right up in there. You know, I, we were right in their bedroom, um, and we knew just right then it, it was just it's time to set up because. What, well, what time of day is this? Morning or evening? It, it's like eleven o'clock. It's eleven o'clock, and you're in the bedroom. Perfect yeah. time, right? Yeah. So what had what had happened is earlier in that. Um, we were calling to the elk, but they were in transition from that feed to heading up to that bed. Right. And what we had to do, we were already way up above them. So we ended up having to just come down, get on the same level because of course the thermals are coming down first thing in the morning. And we had to basically do a big circle and get to where we were just below them with the thermals falling. Um, you know, and that scenario didn't work out because they were going somewhere. And I just assumed that the cows didn't like the situation and they, and they kept going. And of course the bull followed. Um, but whenever we actually finally decided it was time to set up one is because we had the cover. That's, that's number one, whenever I'm trying to look, look for a setup. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and because he responded the way he did, I knew that it was going to be, 
he was a callable bull just because of the way he was he responding was to me. Yeah. He he really wasn't super aggressive right off the bat. Right. But I got him to that point. Yeah. Yeah. Um you asked and I knew that, that because sure. Yeah, and I knew that because of the bull sounds I was making, mm -hmm. he didn't care one bit. He didn't care a bit that there was another bull up there. But the second I let out that cow call, yeah, he, he responded and I was like, it's on, yeah. you know. How's that, Gilbert? It's on like Donkey Kong, right? On like Donkey Kong. That's <laughs> right. When a bull, when a bull, lazy, you know, lazy sounds like, mm -hmm. and, you know, he and, gives that, he, he's not really stirred up, you know, yeah. when he, I mean, it's just like me and you talking, you know, when I get, when I get kind of stirred up, I'm going to really get inflected, you know, Oh yeah. if I'm just kind of, you know, kind of lazy talking, I mean, this is what it is, but bulls are the same way. They're going to, yeah. when they get stirred up in a, in a direction, when they feel that testosterone starts boosting, man, they get, they get off the chain. Their eyes get all red, man. And, uh, it's, it's quite the scene, you know, if you yep. spend a lot of time around them, you can tell when that bull's got more inflection in his voice than he does when he's passive aggressive or even aggressive, you know? Exactly. Absolutely, man. It, it, um, just like that parent, man, it's the same thing. And, and when you have that and, and Cole, I re, if I remember correctly in your situation, it wasn't just a single bowl. There were two bowls together, weren't they? Yeah, that's right. There were two bowls. Yeah. So you have some there that you actually have a little bit of competition as well. I mean, they're kind of partnered up, but they're, they're still coming yeah. in and they're, they're feeling it. Right. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So you had a prime situation the weird thing is there is there was only one bull we physically saw the two bulls but only one bull would respond um which was kind of weird in that scenario well he was the one that was in the mode man i mean yeah was, for sure yeah um so when that when those bulls light up then guys man you got to what you're looking for is people go well how far do i set up 200 150 100 depends on the cover you got to find the best setup if i'm at 200 and i've got this great and i hear this guy coming in and i find an area where i can make myself a tight setup remember tight setup is so that that yeah. bull has to come in within my shooting range to be able to see me man if as soon as i find that i'm going to be there i can always change up if something changes and a lot of times this is cat and mouse it's like chess man you know all of a sudden you make a move your rook goes here goes to the right and that sucker all of a sudden yeah goes to this other way because you didn't know that he had to go around a rock slide or you didn't know that he decided to cross the creek because it was too steep over here at a further side before he turned an yeah. angle coming to you there's all kinds of variables that sometimes you don't see that's where sometimes that base map really comes Don't in handy right and and i remember you guys checking your gps up there as well cole so that you could actually see what was going always, on. always always i'm always dropping pins and figuring out where to circle and how to how to use the terrain to our advantage yep. you know and, and give us that upper hand yep so to segue on that let's say that you heard or saw elk in the area the night before in other words you put them to bed night bugling or you you marked them as you were coming out when you were doing your locating for the first day you use that base map app and you mark or onyx whatever you use out there and you want to mark you know, you can pretty much tell by looking how far the distance is and stuff on there. And you look for certain features and you can kind of mark that. And then the next morning you want to start moving into, oh, at least 300 yards from that area. It's depending on what the wind's doing. If the wind has shifted and it's coming from your direction to them, there's a good chance that they're way closer. If the wind is going towards your right, there's a good chance they're oh, towards yeah, your right yeah. because they will move at night. They will graze easily yeah. according in the direction that the wind's going, right? Yeah. Okay. okay. And, and they won't do it fast. It's just they'll kind of meander Delicious. in that direction. So especially in the morning as things start to change and it gets closer to daylight, they'll start to do that. So let's say that you heard or saw an elk in the area. You put them to bed. You marked it. You moved in 200, 300 yards. Once you move in there, man, sit. Let it get just, man, just let it calm down. Listen first. Then wait for the sign of that first gray light. And now it's time to dip the toe in the water and to try things. And what is it we're going to start out with first, y'all? 
Alcohol. 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 Near to far. Yep, near to far. 80s. So we're going to give it just a real light cow call. And at that point in time, I'm not going to give all that multiple stuff like that. No. I'm in the woods, man. It's going to... That's it. You hear how quiet that was? Because I have no idea how close, how close that bull is to me. I'm going to wait. I don't hear anything. And I'm going to wait. I don't hear anything. Go to the two. Near to far. Okay? Yep. I don't hear anything. <laughs> I'm going to give my little location bugle. Okay? It's a formula, man. Yeah, man. It's it really, a formula. It even works, dude. Yeah. It works. If you I don't know, get anything out of either. that, now I'm back to our general plan. Yeah. Okay? It's our Move. general plan. All right? Okay. So, if I get no responses early on in the morning, like I said, we're going to our general plan until we get to our midday, which is our next step. And what I want to be doing in midday is I want to be using those trails in the upper third, okay? The third from the high, highest point up there, two thirds up, one third down. I want to be approximately in that area, especially if I've done my, my mapping and I see benches, I want to try to go through and work those benches that'll kind of level through there. I want to work the top of those knuckles and maybe a little bit higher up to where they probably gone to bed. And a lot of times they're going to be up a little further than those knuckles when they get in there. It depends on the size of the knuckles, right? Depends on how steep it is up there. So I want to be able to do that. All right, now let's say that my next step on midday, let's say that I've been following elk that I first heard in the morning that are going to the destination. I've heard that, okay? I have now four different options that I'm gonna do with that, basically. My first option is, is that I'm going to parallel and stay on the level of that bull that vocal, if he's vocal, I want to try to stay on his level. Understand he's most likely towards the back, probably has one or two cows behind him, but has a lot of cows in front of him. I'm trying to eliminate eyes, so I want to be on his level, okay? Now, by staying on his level, I have a second option in which I can, because we're going up, it's just like when Chav and I, Chav, we could start in two different areas, three miles apart at the bottom, but what happens at the top? You end up yeah. Come together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because everything gets closer at the top. So as I'm paralleling, a lot of times when I'm paralleling, I can actually end up with an interception. And that's exactly how I killed my, my bull this year. I just stayed paralleling that herd and managed to get a little bit in front of them and, and, and they were coming to me and we got an interception. Okay. It took you like, I don't know, hour and a half, two hours? Yeah, it was probably an hour before I got in the position and i was probably in position another half hour before i mean just waiting there with eyes on waiting until i got a shot getting ready to shoot a cow when all of a sudden i noticed a bull in there. <laughs> so then that changed my focus but yeah it was just working with them so i want to parallel and stay on the level i'm going to probably possibly get a natural interception when they do that and a lot of times what happens is the cows have already started to go ahead in front of me like this i'm on the same level of the bull and so he goes the same way and i end up with an opportunity on the bull third option is a possible call in and when i do that as i'm going up there i'm going to want a cow call first all right if i'm trying to do this i'm gonna to try to pull that bull over using that cow call man the second thing i'm going to do is i'm not going to bugle not yet and there are times you know manano we've done this together where we pulled some bulls but they didn't have the cows going to a destination they were already in their destination yeah. but as you go up sometimes you can get dominant and pull cows your way to pull the bull so that is an option but what i like to do now first of all is i've introduced the cow and i'm gonna do demonstration sounds right yeah so um cole what kind of demonstration sounds do you use bo um a lot of times i'll do uh i like to rake whenever i'm in an area that's I'm close to a bedding area yeah. that's the first thing that i that i start off with 
because it's not really abrasive to anybody or any elk that's in the area, right? Right. You're you're just a bull over there, you know, raking the tree. And if you've already demonstrated that there's a cow there and you started off that light, you know, just the cow call, yep. then, then by going to, and I've had bulls respond back just by raking, you know, not, not doing any other bull sound at all, just hitting the tree with a stick and that dude will fire off, uh, you know, so that's a lot of times I'll start off with uh, right off the bat, you know, just for demonstrating. Absolutely, man. And, and it's exactly what you said. A lot of times, some people start raking without introducing any other elk sounds. I've done the cow calls already. Now I'm starting to rake. And so that automatically sends to that bull that there's another bull over there that is demonstrating for some cows. Yeah, I, can even, right. I can even get to the point now where I do the pan. Well, and before I'm going to demonstrate a little bit, I'm going to try to yeah. now maybe, and, and it's just because, again, I got, you. I got to do it. <laughs> so it's going to be like. <laughs> real quick. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm going to give that just real short lip ball right there that I'm demonstrating for my cow and maybe even his cows. And at sure. that proximity, that could be. Now, I didn't get like like scream at him uh -huh. I didn't like <laughs> I didn't go at him like that man you know so I, I just did a demonstration bugle just like hey ladies I want mine here y'all come on over and that could be enough to incense him that's something that I could try right there okay especially mm -hmm. as we're going up that has possibilities fourth option is to just put them to bed and wait and then i have choices at that point i can either wait till the bull talks on his own just by waiting it out staying on the downwind side staying off even with them up there and, and I, sometimes i'll even go to the top of a ridge or something where my scent will stay where i can still hear where they're at over there sure um so that i make sure i'm not getting any scent in their area and i can just wait till he sounds off or I can put on a scenario. I can do a, a bull with a hot cow scenario and try to pull him off. But I'm going to wait a little bit. I'm going to let them get to bed, let them sit a little bit, make sure the cows are there, and then I'm going to try pulling that bull off. So that is the options I like to use midday following. A lot like what Cole said. It was 11 o'clock. He's in the bedroom. They're going to be there. Now you have a chance to pull those bulls off. Yep. And it it's on, man. It's, it's a great time to do that. Now, what if midday you haven't had any responses moving up to the bedroom level? Uh, or you haven't had, you're down at the bottom, you haven't any, hadn't had any responses, and you're going to move up to that bedroom level. Remember my general playbook. Anytime I'm going to move up in a level, I like to do an advertising bull with cows moving up. I like to use something, or I'm going to use just cows moving up, one or the other. Okay, when I do that, uh, I like to, like if bulls aren't being active, I like to be the one that starts creating the party. And I think sometimes by being a bull that sounds like you have cows, sometimes raises the interest and sometimes triggers a little bit of that testosterone. That's just my theory. I have no science behind it. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't tested any blood or nothing, right? Just many years yeah. of doing it. Yeah. Only 34 bulls. Yeah. yeah. So, 36. 30, 36. If I get up there and I'm at that bedroom level, now I'm going to work trails through the bedding areas like we did when we were still hunting. The only thing is now I'm going to use cow call. Cow call. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. If I smell the critters or I'm seeing fresh sign, they then I'm... There. Yeah, I'm putting down, and we're going to set up a scenario, man. We're going to try to pull it in. We're going to give it time. We're at midday. Yeah. At, I mean, what do we got to lose, man? Most people are at camp, yeah. right? Exactly. Yeah. You, you know, got nothing I, to lose. Nothing to lose. And, I've actually and, had if nothing. happens, if yeah. nothing happens, Joe, you can sit down and munch, take a nap, put, yep. your, put your hammock up. And, yeah. Uh, so I've got a story. Um yep. So a couple years ago, Kyle and I, we hunt Colorado, high pressure, uh, OTC public land, right? And that morning we went out and we had a couple of inexperienced guys, I guess we will we'll call them, ended up kind of screwing up a situation on a couple of bulls. 
Um, so we ended up, well, screw it. We're, let's just go back to camp and we're spiked out. So we're probably six miles from the truck. Um, and we go back to camp and all of a sudden I hear those same guys bugle that came around the mountain and ended up coming towards us. And I told Kyle, I was like, we ought to bugle back at them, you know, just to let them know that they ruined our situation, right? right, right. Well, we ended up getting into this <laughs> extreme bugle match, and these guys were coming in on a string. And all of a sudden, and we're seriously, I'm and I'm filming some of this, you know, and I was like, I got to pay them back a little bit. Well, anyways, all of a sudden, we're sitting in our hammocks in 40 or 50 yards behind us, a bull pipes off and he came in to all the racket that we were sitting there making. Wow. And, uh, Kyle ended up, he ended up passing the bull cause he was completely broke off on one side. Right. Uh, and it was like our, our second day, but it, it could happen at any time Man, when you, blues. when you make that presentation, correct. So what you guys did was you and the other group unknowingly Put on a scenario, man. Yeah. Yeah. Now you had multiple bulls screaming back and forth at each other. That tells other bulls in the area that there's a hot cow. Yeah. So, man, they start moving. They get within a distance, and then they advertise their presence as they start coming in, right? Okay, so yeah. it, it's a perfect situation. Manano, you and Luis had the same thing happen. Now, there were a couple hunters down when you guys were on your own. Do you remember yeah. that? Luis did a good job. Don't tell him that. <laughs> Don't even. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we had an argument, Luis and I, and I said. No, oh. you and Luis have an argument? Yeah, because no. he, was like, he was like, that's a hunter. That's another hunter. And I said, hey, Luis, that's not a hunter. That's an elk. No. Okay. I said, okay. I mean, we were arguing, I don't know, five minutes, and then I, I said, okay, let's give it a try. All of a sudden, the bull just responds, and then we got another response, and he goes, you'll get ready. This is, <laughs> this is going to turn south. <laughs> and, and that bull was back behind you, and that hunter, you know, thought that it was just other hunters. Yeah, so you guys yeah. ended up doing almost the same thing. That Cole almost was the same about thing. Right there. Almost the exact yeah. same thing. And what I want everybody to understand with that is, what they did was the same thing that you can do with multiple callers in your group is create a scenario that actually lights up other bulls and brings them into you because it sounds like two bulls that are dealing, you know, there's a hot cow in the mix, man. That's why they're screaming. You sound like three bulls doing it. You, I mean, it is a rut fest that is going on, man. You had a few cow calls inside there, and I guarantee you, man, uh, you can set up with, shooter with multiple callers there's all kinds of different things that you can do with that so that's what a great midday can happen and cole what time was it when that happened with that situation oh yeah it was it was probably again between like 10 and i would say noon yeah. one o'clock yeah absolutely man they were probably heading back to camp and you know it's one of those deals like that right yeah yep. that they started screaming so so that's the midday and like gilbert said man look if nothing's happening you're already up in the bedding area and you haven't heard anything yet right now man now's a good time like if you want to get that nap if you want to get some munch keep listening and Ooh. then if you have nothing to sound like go work to another ridge in another area and see if you can locate something there so i mean it, you're not going to kill something if you're not out in the woods there's no way you're going to kill it from your bed in camp now there's nothing wrong with if you if you want to go back to camp and you want to do it that's great you know especially if you have things working in an area and you want to get it a chance and you want to go and you're not in something and you're close to camp it's just a lot of different variables that happen with that maybe you hunted back to camp and you're already there it just depends on the situation but that midday if you get up there in those bedroom is a great place to work it's a prime. okay so it's a killer in our afternoon till dark we are up in the bedding area right so we want to work from high to low. 
We want to work from high to low. Again, we're already up. We have the thermals coming. And what I'm looking for a lot of times and what the elk are looking for is the shadows. Once those shadows start to get a little bit long, as soon as you get those shadows, things start to cool off a little bit. All right. Mm -hmm. Now I want to actually do what they do. And I want to start working those travel corridors. And especially by the time the long shadows happen, I want to be halfway to the lower third between the bedding and the feed areas, because yeah. that's where they're at. I don't want to be at the destination. I want right. to be at the areas where they are slowly munching as they're going down to those areas. Okay. Because that's what they're going to do. They're going to slowly get down to there and eat as they're going down. Uh, especially if it's a, if it's a moon situation, they're going to be up in those trees the longest. And I think that is the best time to really work a bull is in that time because they are not really in a hurry to get to their destination like they are in the morning. I think the evening working those travel corridors, working those feed, you know, between the feed and the bedding are some of the best places to do. I want to be where I can get into them early. All right. Yeah, I mean, when I killed when I killed my bull last year, Joe, it's exactly what we did. It was getting towards the end of those, you know, that low lower light situation, and yep. man, we bailed off in one of those ridges and started down, and they were actually, you know, they were actually oh. coming down there too, you know. So yeah, uh, and then multiple bulls down there with cows that are blew up, and multiple herds on each side of the ridge. I mean, it was a uh, kind of a perfect storm but that's exactly how how we, we yep. went about that you know and, and and the only thing i could tell you all is hunt till dark man hunt till dark Absolutely. and and then when it gets dark um get out there do location bugles do um some bugles as you're heading back do something so that you can try to set yourself up put something to bed for the next day you know what was crazy joe is while manano and i were uh caping my bull and and butchering him uh, while y'all had moved on to uh, go and, and try and get the packs to come back with for us, we how many bulls did we hear bugle Manano the whole time? We, the whole time we're cleaning, it's like man, I shut the know, hell up! Different bulls. Uh, it had to be ten different bulls yeah, within a hundred yards of us, Joe. Yeah. I mean, it was crazy the amount of bulls that were in yeah, there going nuts. Crazy. And uh, I told Manano, I said, "Oh my gosh, man, I can we could smell them, and I mean, they were within a hundred yards of us." a yeah, whole please. bunch even even up until the time joe y'all started coming down to us which was pl plenty dark right. right i mean it was so dark you couldn't see your hand in front of your face uh and i'm telling you they were still sounding off you know yeah uh, it was uh, unbelievable they bugled i bet you they bugled in there all night man it was nuts and, and a lot of times people just are not out there to hear that yeah you know, yeah. I mean, there's people that, I mean, how many times we're in camp and we'll wake up and say, well, I heard a bugle over here, heard a bugle from our tent, yeah. you know, because yeah. we've heard different ones. But imagine if you're out there, a lot of times you get to actually hear in those areas where those animals are sounding off. You peg them, you mark them. Again, now you know where elk are. Yeah. And then once you know where elk are, now you can go find those elk. You can create those opportunities. That is key, man, is remember, in order to kill an elk, you have to find an elk. In order to find an elk, you have to locate where they're at. Okay. Exactly right. Hey, so everybody, um, we, we have no Elk Bros mailbox, like I said. Um, tomorrow night... Tomorrow night, it's going to be 7.30 Mountain Time. It's going to be 8.30 Texas Time. We're going to be live tomorrow night on our Elk Bros YouTube channel. We're going to answer our Elk Bros mailbox. We're going to cover, um, we're going to do a little quick hits from some of the things that we have from Finding Elk. Some, so a little bit more information just to get in that head of yours. And we're going to answer any question that you guys have out there. So we're looking forward to seeing you guys tomorrow night absolutely joe absolutely so cole man uh dude uh it was so awesome having you here tonight uh i i, I think me and the guys were we're all looking forward man to the future and absolutely brother man i'm so excited it's so awesome i can't tell y'all how proud i am to be part of the team and i mean i can't wait for september 
Um, you know, I've already got plans. You know, we're going to have to find somewhere where we're going to knock down six or seven bulls for sure. I'm in. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm in, brother. And, and look, you know, we'll probably lean on you a little bit because you've probably been in that area before that, that we're in. We're kind of in a foreign zone for us <laughs> uh, and the bros, man. I mean, we hadn't been up in that country. So uh, hey. we'll probably lean on you a little bit. Yeah, I don't think it's anything that we can't tackle for sure. <laughs> nah, no doubt, man. I feel like every time I step in the woods with my brothers, man, if we we uh, we do exactly what we talked about here and go get amongst them, we're gonna we're gonna get in them and and, uh, and make it happen. Yeah, yeah. this will be the new deadly seven. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. I like that. Uh, three, yeah. three things gonna happen. Yes, sir. Yeah, gonna eat like a king. And <laughs> you're gonna have a blast. <laughs> you're gonna far in the woods yeah, yeah. that's awesome and, and you know what's so cool is i mean it's going to be we're going to have uh rc knox with us oh my uh, god oh really and oh yes absolutely man and guys y'all have no that, clue it, it's yeah, man this is this that's is going to be royalty. it's going to be the most epic elk camp uh you know having everybody together uh, it's going to be so much fun. There's going to be a lot of hunting. There's going to be a lot of grinding. We're going to we're going to go and walk the talk out there, and that's what I'm excited about. I mean, I had somebody, yeah. uh, one of our incredible listeners out there, do me a little text and said, you know, we were talking about areas uh, uh, over in Colorado, and he said, well, this area over here has uh, a real good success rate. And I just told him, man, I said, I'm not worried about the success rate, man. If there, we just want yeah. critters in the woods, we'll go create our own success, man. So yeah. you know, what, Gilbert, man, he said a thing, a little drop the mic Poop. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt dude you better not put us around none of them critters we're taking them home with us <laughs> that's for sure guys if you like what we're doing man please subscribe rate and review us you got to go to apple podcast or itunes to review us and you can check out more elk hunting content at elkbros.com. And just remember, if you're a, a listener of our show and would like your question answered on the show, I promise you we'll get to them. They're just send coming. us your question. Yeah, they're coming. Just send us your question to info at elkbros.com, uh, and uh, we'll definitely get that uh, done for you guys. It's coming. Like Joe said, we're going to go live here. Uh, tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, and y'all are going to y'all gonna flat enjoy that because we like it too that's for sure see all the love that shows up for us and all the questions and uh guys like we say down here in the lone star state husbands kiss your wives wives kiss your husbands hug your babies keep your broad head sharp and your powder dry and we'll see you next week right here on blue collar elk hunting and for all our grinders out there here's some music Man, you've been loving it. If you ain't sticking around for it, you're missing it, man. From Shame our brother on Tony Wintrip to close out the show. Peace, peace, everybody. Peace out. Peace, peace. I like to put my tag on you. I've been hunting a lot of years. I had one too many missed shots and one too many beers. I saw you rolling in when the lights went down But you never even had a clue So I left the blind on a Sunday afternoon I think I'd like to put my tag on you Well, I spent a couple nights in the window Watching the wind blow by I'm wondering where you're gonna make your bed at And where you'll go with that sunrise Do you see yourself in the hands of a man with the working man blues? Damn about the money Here's the cold hard truth I think
I'd like to put my tag on you Space in my man cave that my buddies recognize, and it has your name all over it. But you gotta jump that fence tonight. The full moon is rising, and tomorrow's sky is blue. On you. Yeah. I'd like to put my tag on you. I'd give anything but my rifle that my grandpa passed through. Yeah. I'd like to put my tag on you. You got the biggest rack, and Lord knows that I have passed a few. Damn about the money Here's the cold hard truth I'd like to put my tag on you I'd like to put my tag on you Oh yeah, baby 